Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? I've got a minor problem with my bookshelf speakers here. Let's crack them open, see what's going on, and hopefully it's an easy fix. It's been a while since I've done a video about home stereo kind of stuff. This is just going to be a bit more laid back, casual kind of a thing. This is my pair of JBL Control One Plus bookshelf speakers. I've had these for probably eight years or so at this point. I picked them up used off of eBay. I've always wanted a pair of these ever since I heard them decades ago i always really liked their sound quality they're not amazing speakers by any means but they've got that kind of typical fun jbl kind of sound and there are some particular attributes about this model in particular that made me more interested in them than other models and even some brand new speakers the Control One Plus is part of a larger lineup of JBL's, let's say, installation series speakers. These weren't generally sold to the public. I mean, if you wanted a pair, you could go to a dealer and buy them, but these were intended more for professional use. This particular model and its larger cousin, the Control 5 Plus, were meant mostly for recording studio use as like monitor speakers. They wouldn't have been your primary monitor, so these were meant more for checking just to see how it would sound kind of roughly as if a regular person were listening to it through their home stereo. Uh, the Yamaha NS10, you might have heard of that model. It's another just classic speaker that started in the 80s and they served the same purpose. They weren't fantastic sounding speakers, but they were good sounding speakers and meant to kind of replicate what the average home listener would hear. I think that's really kind of these speakers purpose in the recording studio, but they saw use outside of recording studios too. These were often used in permanent installations in commercial facilities for background music or very small PA systems, that sort of thing. But for my use, I just use them as regular home stereo speakers. They're just a standard 8 ohm design, nothing fancy. They just hook right up to any amplifier or receiver, no big deal. And I think they sound pretty good. They've got a nice kind of sound quality to them. JBL has generally been known for a more, I guess you could say fun sound signature. You know, the bass is a little bit more emphasized and the highs are a little bit more crisp and for just casual use listening at home and not doing any sort of like critical listening, I think they're a great option. So what's wrong with these? Well, it's primarily a problem with just one of them, although I have had them both do it. It's pretty simple. When I first start listening to music to these, like I turn the amplifier on and turn the volume up and start playing music, one of them will usually be a little bit quieter than the other. And then the way to fix it is to simply just briefly turn the volume up and then it'll just kind of pop to life, right? The speaker will come back to normal volume and then I can turn the volume on the amplifier back down to the level I want to listen to and it'll stay that way. So it's intermittent. It's really hard to reproduce on demand. Otherwise, I'd give you a demo of it, but it's it's really pretty simple. And I'm guessing that it's a component problem with the crossovers in these. The reason why I'm thinking it's potentially a component problem, and I've already exonerated the amplifier and the speaker wires as being the fault, is that these speakers are actually about 30 years old, if not a little bit older. The Control series goes all the way back to the mid to late 80s, and the Control One Plus is kind of a derivative of the classic JBL Control One, which actually started life as a model called the Pro 3. It's got like a five inch kind of woofer and they've, they've changed the materials that some of the drivers have been made out of over the years. But the big benefit to the One Plus series is you basically get better components. They were built to a higher standard, better drivers, better parts in the crossover. They were designed to sound better. You paid a little bit more, Unfortunately, I don't really know what these sold for brand new. When I bought them used like eight or so years ago, I paid about a hundred bucks for the pair. 
I'm going to guess based on what brand new Control 1s sell for now, that these were probably in the like $400 a pair kind of range. So not cheap, but not super expensive either. You can actually buy brand new Control 1s still to this day. They don't sell the Plus models anymore, and some would argue that the Control 1s have gotten cheaper over the years, like in terms of their construction. These, I think, were worth the extra money back then, just because of uh, some things about them that I think helped them stand the test of time a little bit better than a run-of-the-mill pair of Control 1s. So I'm going to focus on the right speaker because it's the one that exhibits the problem more frequently than the left. I will, of course, check both of them out. And speaker maintenance is actually something that you, you don't think that you would need to do, but once speakers reach about 30 years old, it actually is something you need to begin to consider. I mean, a lot of people, they just buy new speakers or whatever, and a lot of the times that is a good way to go just because you get the benefits of newer technology and better design and all that sort of thing but there is actually a large group of people some of whom aren't really even all that crazy about being audiophiles so to speak they just like vintage speakers the way they sound or the way they look or whatever and i'm kind of right there with them i think you know there are some really cool old speakers from like the 70s and 80s that just sound great and they look really cool and it can be kind of cheap to get into depending on the model you're going for. These, when they do pop up on eBay, they actually still are fairly inexpensive. They don't show up too often, at least the plus models, but I feel like you could probably still pick up a pair of these in the $100 to $150 range, and that's a pretty good value. Anyway, let's take a look at this speaker and see what's going on and what we got to do to fix it up. Yeah, let's just get left one out of the way and I marked which one is the right one yep with this piece of red tape on the back just to make sure I wouldn't get them mixed up the grills on these come off just super easy they just they just pop off it's a metal mesh grill with this rubber gasket around the outside and then you can see the drivers this is a five and a quarter I believe inch woofer one inch titanium dome tweeter if i remember correctly and these were both upgrades from the regular control ones the big thing about this model other than the better quality parts that made me interested in it is the woofer itself notice that it's in really good shape and that's because jbl spent a couple extra bucks and used a butyl rubber surround on the woofer that means this thing is pretty much never going to fail. Like, uh, other than accidentally overdriving it and like cooking the voice coil or whatever, which there's protection for, and we'll check that out when we crack this thing open, I think. But a, a classic problem with old speakers, and why I say that when they hit about 30 years old, you need to start considering maintenance, is that a lot of drivers have foam surrounds that hold the cone to the basket. And after about 30 years, depending on how good a quality of parts the manufacturer used, that foam can start to degrade. It basically just falls apart. And when it does, the driver stops working correctly. It can cause damage if you leave it for too long and, you know, play it with torn surrounds or degraded surrounds. It's not impossible to fix. And there are actually businesses out there that specialize in doing that kind of repair. And lots of people tackle it themselves. There are tons of videos on YouTube, in fact, about replacing the surrounds on original Control 1s. I'll include a link down in the description to one of those episodes, um, if I can find it. But I just don't have to worry about that with this speaker because they went with butyl rubber. Some nice peace of mind. It'll make the driver perform the way it was supposed to perform throughout its entire lifetime. And it's just one less thing to worry about. Anyway. Let's flip this thing around. And there's some interesting things to note on the back here too. Obviously they've got, you know, the brand and everything molded into the back, the JBL, you know, seal of quality holographic sticker, which is kind of cool. Unfortunately, I can't decipher the serial number to figure out when this particular speaker was manufactured. I know this model was introduced in the late eighties and discontinued sometime in the early to mid nineties. They didn't have a terribly long production run. And based on the serial number, 
This was only the 2,363rd speaker to have been manufactured. And yes, the other speaker has a sequential serial number, so they were sold in pairs. Another thing that I also find really interesting is this, uh, this sticker, made in Japan. JBL is an American company, and at this time they were owned by Harman International. Harman owns a bunch of audio brands, and actually these days they're owned themselves by Samsung. That was a very weird acquisition, but yeah, I guess they had a manufacturing plant in Japan. And strangely enough, the Japanese, like the audiophile circles in Japan, seem to have kind of an affinity for JBL speakers. I don't know if it's just some cultural thing or if they appreciate the fact that a you know a major American manufacturer at that time like trusted Japanese you know craftsmanship and all that to build their high-end speakers if it's like a, a pride thing and you know I don't know but there are some just like really interesting cases of companies in Japan that specialize in like restoring old JBL speakers like from the 70s and 80s and they go for crazy money I mean these are really high-end systems Another interesting thing to note is you can actually get mounting brackets for these speakers. There's no threaded inserts on the back though. So how did that work? Well, the brackets were kind of goofy. There's these notches like on the top here and then these two on the back and there's another one on the side. The mounting bracket was basically like a big clamp thing that went across the back and locked into those notches. And then you could, you know, put the bracket on the wall and then this loop with the metal ring was for a safety cable in case for very unlikely that the, you know, the mounting bracket were to fall off the speaker or whatever, it'd somehow get unclipped. You'd have like a, a steel wire that would get tied off through this ring and, you know, screwed into the wall as well. So if it fell off the bracket, it wouldn't come crashing down and, you know, hit someone in the head or whatever. So again, that's kind of another nod to like the professional nature of these speakers is that they're thinking of that sort of thing. They know these are meant for permanent install. And in fact, you can see some of the kind of scraping on the plastic housing here. It looks like these speakers probably were in mounting brackets at some point in their life. I have no idea where or what they were used for. They don't appear to have been, you know, put anywhere that, you know, would have degraded the cabinets or anything. Like there's a little bit of yellowing on this rubber pad on the top and bottom. It's like a big giant foot, equally for design as it is for, you know, helping isolate the speaker from the table or whatever, if you've got them, you know, in a, on a shelf or something, keep them from vibrating. But overall, these are in just really good shape. Regular speaker wire terminals on the back, and this is actually a design that JBL used on a lot of other models. I've got a pair of Infinity bookshelf speakers that have the exact same kind of terminals, so that's a standard part. And I'm going to guess that when we take this thing apart, we'll actually see something really interesting going on on the back side of this input terminal. I warned you this was going to be like a super casual episode where I was just going to like rattle on for a long time, right? Okay, just we're all on the same page. Anyway, um, it's just six hex screws that hold this front panel to the rest of the chassis. I'm hoping and assuming that both drivers can just stay in this front panel and get lifted out as a unit, and then I just disconnect the wires inside. I'm not suspecting anything wrong with the drivers themselves. I think they're fine. I think the problem I need to look into is in the crossover, but let's just get these taken out and uh, see where that leads us. All right, so that was easy enough. Now let's... Uh, figure out what it takes to separate this. You can see it looks like there is kind of a mold line and I think it separates along through here and then kind of goes up and around the top. I'm hoping, oh yeah, there we go. Yep, just pops loose. Doesn't look like they used any adhesive to hold it together, at least not much. There's a small amount, but yeah, the drivers can stay. All right, sweet. And it's magnetically shielded. So again, kind of, I guess, reference to using them in a studio or whatever. If you were doing video work, put these next to a CRT, no problem. Let me get these disconnected from the woofer and the tweeter. I just noticed something kind of neat on these drivers. We take a look at the back. 
They color coded the terminals. So you know which one's positive and negative. That little red stripe. Neat little attention to detail there. This woofer is super beefy. Like this thing is legit got some weight to it. So there's a nice magnet in there. And uh, obviously the, the shielding. Thick plastic too. I mean, this thing is not flimsy. I can't really twist it or anything. The port is in the front, which I also really liked about this model. A lot of bookshelf speakers are rear ported and that can cause limitations when you're setting them on an actual bookshelf. You have to make sure that they're backed away from the wall so as to not obstruct that port. You don't have to worry about that if they're front ported. All right, here's the, uh, the insides. We've got a little bit of batting in here just for acoustic dampening, I guess. The red and black is for the woofer. The blue and black is for the tweeter. And yeah, as I kind of suspected, the crossover is actually built into the speaker terminals. I'm going to try and remove it because it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to work on if I remove it. But I may have to take these parts off first, which we'll talk about because they're pretty interesting. All right, looks like. I'm careful. Ooh. Yeah, I think we can. There's just enough room here to remove that intact. Cool. You definitely have to take the speaker apart, you know, if you want to remove this because you have to disconnect the wiring from the drivers, but that makes working on this much easier, just being able to straight up remove it. Yeah, let's check this thing out. This is, like I said, kind of a really interesting design. It's this integrated input terminal crossover module like they just built it all into one thing and that's kind of neat i mean obviously it speeds assembly because now they don't have to worry about figuring out where to mount a crossover pcb inside the enclosure and getting everything wired up or whatever right like you manufacture this and you slap it in the back of the speaker and you're done it's also just neat and tidy and a lot easier to work on since you can just straight up remove it and here you can see kind of all the parts of a speaker crossover Everything that handles frequency response and everything is on this side. So we've got resistors, caps, and a couple of coils. Long story short, you obviously want to split the audio signal between the woofer and the tweeter, and there's what they call the crossover point where the tweeter won't play lower than a certain frequency and the woofer won't play higher than a certain frequency. And the components on here help do that. So they'll cause the woofer to roll off gently starting at a certain frequency and then cause the tweeter to start kind of rolling on gently at a certain frequency. Some speakers will also employ a few extra components on here to kind of shape the sound, like they can figure out ways to increase bass response or increase the treble or reduce the treble. In fact, some speakers, especially ones from the 70s and 80s, will often have like a what looks like a volume knob on the front of them that can allow you to change the frequency response of the speaker. You know, maybe turn the tweeter down a little bit or turn the woofer up and down a little bit. If you wanna kind of play with the EQ that way, maybe it'll give you a little bit more control than what you would otherwise get out of your amplifier. Obviously, this is just a very straightforward thing. It's just fixed frequencies at the crossover point and all that sort of thing. I'm not worried about any of these components themselves being the cause of that problem with the, you know, the intermittent low volume, because generally, if these parts were to fail, and really the only thing that would fail that I can tell would be the capacitor, you would hear a change in the sound quality more than you would have that intermittent low volume thing. I have already tried cleaning the speaker terminals with contact cleaner, so I don't think it's necessarily a connection issue dealing with like the wires or anything. I'm suspecting potentially like just a cold solder joint on the PCB or something like that. But that does lead us to these things. And this is perhaps one of the most interesting parts of speaker design from back then. JBL did this, a few other manufacturers did this. They've got these sleeves on here. This is actually like for, I believe for heat dissipation kind of purposes, like a thermal sort of thing. That's because these are light bulbs. And you may be wondering why in the hell are they putting light bulbs inside a speaker? It's incredibly clever. If you send too much power into a speaker 
you're likely going to damage it, right? If you've got an amplifier that's too powerful for the speaker or you've just got the thing cranked way the hell up, you know, there's a couple of different ways that you can damage a speaker in that scenario. The first one is physical damage in the terms of like over excursion, where you've got the cone of the speaker like physically hitting its limits. It's being pulled too far back or being pushed too far forward and it can't go any further. You do that enough and you're going to damage physically, you know, the what they call the motor assembly, basically the parts that move inside the speaker. The other thing that you can damage though with too much power are the parts inside, specifically the voice coil. It's not necessarily a mechanical thing so much as it is that you're like burning out the wire. I mean, you can see this is kind of thin wire, but what goes into a voice coil is even thinner. It's that very thin epoxy coated wire. Sometimes people call it magnet wire because speakers are basically an interaction between permanent magnets and electromagnets and you send power through the electromagnet and that's what causes the speaker to move. Well, if you send too much power through that thin wiring inside the speaker, it can burn through that coating on the, the wire itself in the coil and cause shorts and cause it to burn out and then you're cooked. So what some manufacturers do is they'll put fuses inside the speaker as part of the crossover assembly. The problem with fuses is that, yeah, they work really well, right? You give the speaker too much power and the fuse will pop and it protects the speaker. But then you got to take the speaker apart and replace the fuse. It's a one time kind of thing, right? The genius part about using the light bulbs is that their resistance increases the more power you put through them. This is basically taking advantage of that property. The more power that goes through these, the brighter the bulb is going to burn, but that's also going to increase the resistance. So it's kind of this like self clamping effect. Basically, once you start hitting the point on these bulbs where they start really glowing, they're going to limit how much power is actually going out to the drivers. So if you're just starting to hit the limits of clipping and that sort of thing, these can kind of save you from yourself and bring that power level down safely in a way that doesn't damage the speaker at all. And it's just a really clever way of doing it, using light bulbs basically as like speaker limiters. Now, just at a glance, I'm not really seeing anything obviously wrong with this crossover or the connections on it. I'm going to just gently bend those bulbs out of the way to get a look at these. I mean, everything looks fine. And this speaker was manufactured in an era before the whole lead free solder thing really became something to worry about. So cracks in solder joints can be really hard to visually see sometimes. So I think the safest bet is just reflow these. I'm just going to reflow these joints and probably clean the contacts on the wires that go to the speakers. That's something I haven't done yet. They look visually pretty clean too, but who knows? We'll just clean it all up and go from there. Just notice this label on there, Ely Tone 9550L. Any uh, JBL experts out there know what that's about? I'm guessing that's just kind of like the, the name of this part. I don't know if that's a JBL thing or if maybe they like subcontracted this module out to another manufacturer. I don't know.
And there we go. I got the other one taken care of as well. Just reflowed its solder joints just to make sure it looked just as good as the first one. Gave them a quick test. They're both working fine. Of course, it was kind of an intermittent thing, so only time will tell if that really fixed the problem or not, but I have a feeling it did. Just who knows where these have been before. And I should note that that intermittent, like lower volume problem, I've been dealing with ever since I got these. So it's not something new that's developed. Maybe one of these got dropped at some point and just because they've got really, you know, resilient housings, there's no external signs of damage or anything. Who knows, but it was an easy enough fix. Oh, I guess something else worth pointing out is the other interesting thing about the Control One Pluses is also kind of noting to their, I guess, semi-studio heritage, their mirror image, the left and right ones. Um, they, they look pretty cool with the grills off, and I actually do like the two-tone woofer with the black dust cap and the white cone and then the black rubber surround, and you actually can still see that with the grills on. I like leaving the grills on, plus you get the cool kind of special blue stripe on the JBL badge. Normally that stripe is orange. Anyway, just again, kind of a fun, casual, let's hang out kind of video, just going through these. I love these little speakers. They're just super neat. And you can still, like I said, buy brand new regular control ones. Are they amazing? No, they're not, but they sound good. And if you just need passive speakers, I think in the right application, they can be perfectly well suited. The other thing that's kind of been on my radar for many years now is picking up a pair of these bigger brother, the Control 5. Those have, I believe, like a six or seven inch woofer in them. So basically better bass response. I remember looking at those as a kid, kind of wanting a pair of them just because they were, they were very common in the early 90s, shall we say, for permanent audio installs and studio use and that sort of thing. And they actually still make the Control 5s as well. I'd rather have a vintage pair of them though, the made in Japan ones, instead of the brand new ones, because the new ones are all just rolling off an assembly line in China. Does that make them bad? No, not necessarily, but I do think, honestly, the build quality, probably a little bit better with these made in Japan models. Anyway, if you like this one, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.